In this CGA Celebrity Golf Series, you're going to meet Mike Davis. Mike played for 10 years in the Oakland A's system, eight years in the outfield with the A's, and in 1988, Mike signed as a designated hitter with the Los Angeles Dodgers. In the 1988 World Series, he hit a two-run home run in Game 5 that clinched the World Series title for the Dodgers. And now, CGA's president, Mark Everly, will show Mike the important role balance plays in the golf swing. Hello, and welcome to another CGA Celebrity Golf Series. My name is Mark Everly. I'm the director of the CGA. Along with me today is Rod English, our regional director from Detroit, and Mike Davis. Uh, man, we're going to take a look at Mike's golf swing. Mike has a lot of baseball skills, a lot of athletic skills, and we're trying to translate that into the golf game and the golf swing for Mike. So Mike, why don't you go ahead and get set up to the golf ball. We got out on the golf course yesterday and what did we talk about? A couple of things we talked about. What were they? You gave me a couple great tips. One was the, on the finish. Right. And um, what I was doing, I had a pretty good swing, but I would finish in several different places with no balance and stuff. And that's what caused me to spray the ball around the course. Right. Exactly. And as a hitter, as a sweet swinger with a baseball mm -hmm. bat, you know the value of balance in your swing. Very much so, yes. But we were missing that in our golf swing. Correct. And we started with ball position. You weren't consistently getting in the same position every time. And that would be walking, a lot like walking up to home plate, taking a different stance every time. Very good. That wouldn't be a good idea. Are you, everything <laughs> is keyed in, locked in. in okay, what you, what you good. So let's go ahead and get you set up. Let's talk about ball position and what you need to do to become a little more consistent. Because like you said, you have a good swing. It's very solid, and we don't have to make any big changes, but we have to make you more consistent and take advantage of the athletic ability you have. Okay? Amen. So let's take a look at your position. <clears throat> and remember, what was happening is even on your driver and your woods, where was the ball getting? I was, I, was, I was setting the ball up too far back in my stance where when I would, on my downswing or my approach to the ball, I couldn't get the club face closed, and it caused me to push the ball to the left more than I wanted to. Exactly. Exactly. So simply, the only thing we've done is we've moved the ball forward. Correct. Into a better striking position. So go ahead and get set up, and let's check. And I'm going to use a couple of golf balls to show the difference. You try to get it in the position we want, and then we'll talk about the mistake you were making and what was getting you out of position. Okay, excellent. Now, right there, when we took a look at you yesterday, I noticed, and, and Rod was mentioning too, your the ball position was back. back there. And it was very difficult for you get, to get the golf club square at impact. So that explains all of those great shots where we happened to lose the golf ball. They were, you know, the ones that went straight, but they <laughs> landed with a splash or, I, you know, ricocheting off trees. I vaguely remember those. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's get you set up and get you started. And then we're going to take a couple of swings and let people see that athletic move that made you such a good hitter and how we're turning that into a golf swing. Excellent. Now, when you look down from there, again, what I want you to look at is look down at your hands. Now, do you see your hand position and how your hands are now at the front edge of the golf ball? Yes. And what happens if we move that ball position back to here? Remember, your hands were exaggerated out in front. Mm -hmm. And that's a visual for you to make sure that you start with, the with your hands just in front of the ball. That's okay. good. <clears throat> that's a good key I for you. I could remember that one real well. I like that. And our goal is not for you to have to follow me around the rest of your life so I can remind you and teach you. Our goal is to give you a key that you can go out there and figure it out yourself. You're beating me it's, down it's, here. <laughs> it's my, I enjoy your company, but I just don't have time. <laughs> so let's get set up. Okay. And let's take a look at it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you go ahead, hit a couple of shots, and you fire away when you're ready. And we want to watch. Excellent. Weakness. Weakness. Excellent shot. That's, that's taking advantage of that athletic ability you have. But we've got to make sure you're in position to be able to use it. That's, that's okay. the key for you. There's, there's no major surgery here. 
And that's those good are, news. Those, I mean, the, the tips that you've given me are excellent because I've never heard those before. And they're simple. Right. And that that's, works well for me. That's the key. Simple. <laughs> that relates well to me, too, as far as teaching. It, mm -hmm. If it's simple, I can teach it easier. And I, <laughs> I see people pick it up much easier as well. So let's get set up again. And we're going to do it one more time because I want folks to watch the strength of your swing and the athletic move and everyone to be thinking about ball position. Good. Gracious. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's just, and you see the value of being able to repeat the shot. That's that's what I what, that, that's the one thing I wasn't able to do. I'm <clears throat> when you when you stand over the ball and you know you can hit it st pretty good, but you're not sure if it's going to go straight or not. Exactly. And it's um, that the, the thing that you said about the finish was so awesome to me. Right. That's what we're going to take a look at now is the finish. Uh, it's probably one of the most misunderstood parts of the golf swing. In fact, when we work with kids we start by teaching them the finish and let them go backwards from there. Because okay. most people enjoy swinging the golf club. Mm -hmm. They want to swing the golf club. Now, just like we have you in, a, in, a, in an excellent starting position, you're going to try to find that every time. Yes. And do you remember what I said about the finish? For most people, what happens is, in fact, when people would come to me, and typically with the finish, people ask me, can you take a look at my swing? And... Without trying to be a comedian, I'll watch them four or five times, and they're finishing in a different place every time, and I have to ask them, which swing do you want me to work on? <laughs> so our goal is to give you one swing, again, to simplify the process. You kind of mentioned something like that yesterday. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be brutal here, Mike. It's just that, that harsh reality wakes you up, and it, it spurs you on. I know it. Oh, very good. So let's get in our, let's get in our setup position again. And without the golf ball, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is let you go ahead and swing. And I want you to get to the finish position. Okay. You go ahead. Hold your finish. Hold it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I thought I was solid. We're talking too. about balance here, Mike. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can do that a little better. <laughs> One more time. One more time. Now, see, I don't have to push. I can tell. You're waiting for me to push, so you knock me over. <laughs> Come push me. Come and push I'm, me. <laughs> I'm not going to try it. Good. Now, one of the things that we talked about with your driver, and I noticed it a lot yesterday, and I, and I asked you, has anyone ever told you to keep your head down? It's the most commonly given golf instruction on the face of the earth. Everyone has either been told to keep their head down or they've told someone to keep their head down. And if you watch Mike take his swing, go ahead one more time. And what I want you to do is I want you to watch his head position as he swings the golf club. And let's see what he does with his head. Let's see if he keeps his head down like everyone would tell him to do. See how his head releases with the shot? If his head does not release with the shot on the golf ball, he can't get to a strong finish. And what he's doing, he's then hitting the golf ball with half a swing. And most, most of the time, the reason, and I'm sure when you started playing golf, how long have you been playing golf now, Mike? I've been playing about 10 years. Okay, now. so when you got started, you probably remember a lot of those top shots mm -hmm. and the frustration. I can remember even playing with some people and the frustration of, playing with that person, topping the shot, and topping the shot, what comes out of your mouth? Keep your head down, because it only makes yeah. sense if you're hitting it on yeah. top. Let's get underneath it. Yeah. So let's try to keep our head down. Well, go ahead and get set up, and let me show you something. This is interesting. This is something that's very interesting. Now, if I tell you to keep your head down, what are you going to do? You're going to try to force it to stay there, right? Correct. So you're going to tighten these muscles, and you're going to tighten your neck muscles, and then start to take your club. Now, see what happens? As you lock all those muscles in together, what takes place, as soon as I lock those muscles, trying to keep my head down, 
my first move is up. Where does my head go? Up. It follows those big muscles because it's locked together. So okay. what you want to do, if there's someone out there that you know, you're playing a Nassau with and you're down one or two, just go over and whisper to them, keep your head down. <laughs> okay. We want to do just the opposite. We want to stay relaxed and, and let our eyes follow the golf ball. We teach the kids, if the ball's here, watch it. When you hit it, what do you do? Watch it. You watch it. <clears throat> Simple okay. game, isn't it? So this time, go ahead and swing and let's release with it. Okay, very good. And then we'll hit a golf ball. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That was pretty bad. That's okay. Grass that grows good. back. One more time. Nice and relaxed. Very good. A little wobbly on the finish. Yes, I felt that. Uh huh. Now, how, I, I mean, I. That's that's exactly what I'm trying to work out. Right. Is that, that consistency where I can finish in that right. same spot. Let me tell you what I preach to the kids. <laughs> okay. And the reason I always bring up, I've been teaching the kids now for ten years, and what it's taught me, it's taught me how to teach. Because okay. we go to the simplest level. And what I've taught the kids is, every, you ask every one of the kids who've gone through our youth instructional leagues, and they'll tell you if you ask them, okay, Mike, if you fell over at your finish, why did you do it? They'll tell you, because I'm swinging too fast. That's why we give you a finish. You have a start point, and you have a finish point, and you're swinging between those two. Up until you have a finish point, it's unlimited, and you're swinging off the world. Uh huh. What we're doing is we're giving control and tempo to your swing. Very good. So <clears throat> don't swing through your finish, which is what you're doing. One more time, then we're going to hit a shot. Then I'm going to have, then I'm going to have us take a look at Rod real quick, and he'll show us a couple of positions. Nice and relaxed. Release with the ball. Weights forward. I would say that was a probably a double in the left center gap. What do you think? <laughs> Good. Okay, let's hit this one. Okay. Nice and relaxed. Line it up. Good. Excellent. Make sure you're keeping track of your position. One of the important things is never try to work on two things at a time. Take them one at a time. Good. Excellent. Good finish, nice and solid, released with the shot. Okay, Mike, real quick, what I want to do with Rod is, Rod, go ahead and get set up with the golf ball. And just real quickly, because this is really geared to the individual. Now, you'll notice how narrow Rod's stance is. Mm -hmm. Rod's a tall guy, but he, but he takes a very narrow stance. I'm shorter, and I take a wide stance. And what happens is that's going to give an appearance of a different ball position. That's why it's key for us to take, take a look at where our hands are at because it would re be real easy for Rod with his position to let his hands float back here, just hang them down, and he gets behind the ball. Mm -hmm. The reason we want our hands in front of the ball is because that's the way we're going to make contact, so we want to start them there so we never have to move them to there. They're always there. So go ahead and get set up, Rod. And just show us a practice swing and one little tip. And, and Mike, watch, watch Rod's finish. And this is the way to check your finish. See his right toe? Uh huh. We have a drill that we have our kids, we make them tap their toe. You know what that proves to us and to them? That they've made the athletic move through the golf ball. And that's the weight shift exactly. to the front side. Exactly. Okay. Go ahead, one more swing. And it has nothing to do with how wide your feet no. are? Because that's, that's a personality thing, and I don't try to put everyone into the same box. But there are some things that have to be done properly. Hand position is one of them, ball position, and finish. One more time. A little rocky. Yeah, a little wobbly. And you know you're not allowed to do that anymore. Good. Excellent. We have some more things to cover, and we're going to go over a few things. Thanks for joining us for the instruction with Mike. Uh, we're going to keep working at it, and we'll see you in a little bit. Thanks. Okay, let's uh, go ahead. I want you to get a couple of shots now. This Celebrity Golf Series is brought to you in part by CGA. 
Get involved with the CGA Youth Instructional League program in your community. Contact your local CGA chapter or CGA National on the web at www.cga.org. Folks, thanks for joining us. I've invited Mike to sit down with us, and we want to try to get to know him a little bit better and see what's going on in his life besides the golf game. We know him as a baseball player, and we just want to sit down and see what we can find out. Mike, Major League Baseball, started what year with the Oakland A's? Uh, 19, well, started in their, in their organization in 77 out of high school. My first year in the Major Leagues was in 1980 playing Billy Ball with Billy Martin as our manager. <laughs> and um, in 87 uh, was my last year there and, and went to the, play with the Dodgers as a free agent in 1987. And it just so happened we met up against the A's in the World Series in 1988. And uh, if you remember the, the Kurt Gibson home run that was, head of, that was heard around the world, they say this is my claim to flame is that um, I walked before the Kurt Gibson home run, and he stepped up to the plate and, and hit this home run that um, that won game one for the Dodgers and gave us the momentum to go on and, and beat the A's in five games. But the truth is about your home run. Yes, the truth about my home run is um, I, had, I, I, I had the worst year ever as a professional that year. And... Um, to talk about myself, I was humpsuck. I was terrible. Let's just be honest. I was just terrible that year. And so when you're when you're not used to doing being that bad, you're and you're a Christian and you're praying all the time and you're saying, God, this this ain't no fun. <laughs> you, know, you talk a lot of, about a lot of different things, but um, I, in prayer, I got a word from God for such a time as this. Have I brought you to this point that I may get the glory out of your life? And the word came that I would end up hitting a home run in the World Series. We hadn't even finished winning our division yet. But we were leading, so it looked like we were going to do that. And I said, oh, this is awesome. So I started getting ready to do this. I told my, the, some of my teammates that this is what I was going to do. And they laughed at me because they knew I, I was in Tommy's doghouse and I wasn't going to play. I needed a 60-foot bat if I was going to get in the game whatsoever. And so when... Uh, Jose Canseco for the Oakland A's hit a grand slam to put the A's up four to one or four to nothing. And we came back and it was a four to three ball game. They brought in Dennis Eckersley, who had set new records that year and it was just automatic. He would shut you down. So they brought him in in the ninth and he started, he proceeded to do just that, punched out the first two batters. Tommy called me to come in and, and hit. So I came up in the bottom of the ninth with two outs. First pitch Dennis threw, I swung, fouled it straight back, couldn't believe I missed it, but I did. The next four he threw were four or five inches outside and he walked me. Then Kurt Gibson came up and hit a home run that was heard around the world that gave the Dodgers momentum to go and beat the, beat the um, A's in five games. Well, initially, if I would have wrote the script, it would have been a little different. It would have been <laughs> Kurt walking. I'd have hit that one, but it, it, you can't do it that way. And so when it came down to down around game five, I really had forgotten about what I had said to my teammates and um, about the home run. And then I came up with my second at bat, and I hit a home run in game five, and they finally scored a run off of Earl Hershiser to put us up four to one, four to, four to one. Um, and as I was running the bases, I couldn't believe how faithful God is. Even at times when we become faithless and I, I and it, it was blowing me away how he still honored his word it, it was I think it was <laughs> that's a, that's a great I, he's so faithful I'm sorry about that I, he I, really is it has to be hard for mm. people to believe that that's what you're thinking oh, running the bases man. isn't that incredible though I was I, <laughs> it was just a doubt I, I doubted him so much and um it but shows it was us real. it's not us. It's yeah, not, it's that's not right. you. That's it's right. God. Out of anyone in history, past or present, 
you're a golfer, you know what that means to play a round of golf with someone, four or five hours, sit down, have lunch. What one person would you pick to play a round of golf with? Okay, you won't offend me if you don't say me. <laughs> I, I, I know that was your, your instinct, but who would you pick? To play a round of golf with. That's a deep Man, one, isn't it? That is deep. <laughs> I wouldn't mind playing around with uh, Michael J. For, for one thing. And the, I, I tell you what is even more exciting. If you're talking the greatest person that ever was, it would be a miracle to play around with Jesus Christ. That would be awesome. He'd probably shoot an 18. <laughs> <laughs> that would be wild. Well, see, that's, I like to ask that question because it's revealing. Mm -hmm. I think it reveals something inside and who you want a companion with tell something about us. Don't you agree? Oh, I, I definitely do. I have, um, I mean, the, for me, I, I, I used to play baseball. And the one thing I'm not very good is talking about myself and what I did in baseball and my highlights and junk like that. That's Do you want me to brag where, about you? I'd love to. You were awesome. Need to, no, you, you were awesome. Man. You don't need to do that. And so, <laughs> but what what is really, for me, what, where my light comes on on the inside is when I get an opportunity to share Jesus Christ with the people. And, and having traveled around with unlimited potential for a number of years, it is so exciting to see what he has done in the lives of people around the world. And it's so, it's, it's so simple and it's so loving. And um, it, it, it turns me on. It really does. Tell me about, man, let's, let's, let's explore that a little bit. For your life, you know, you talk about the excitement and sing it happening in others' lives. Mm -hmm. How about, when was that moment when it clicked with you? Well, um, for myself, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a church whatsoever. Me and my father, and the, we had six kids in our family. We were always out in the yard, either playing basketball or catch or football or all the little sports-oriented things that, that, to me, that the average family does. And the most important thing at, at that time when we were growing up were make sure you don't bring home any Fs or Ds <laughs> or, you'd, or you'd be in trouble. <laughs> My father was a Marine, and so that would create a Ouch. problem, you know. So, um, no, I, didn't, I, had, I had, didn't grow up in the church whatsoever, but I had one link to the church, and that was my grandmother. And she was a spirit-filled believer who was always praying for everybody. And... Um, we didn't get, matter of fact, in growing up, there were some tremendous things that took place that we didn't even give God credit for. One happened to be, I had a sister when she was four years old, had encephalitis of her brain, where she went five years where she couldn't speak or hear. And my mother and father took her to doctor after doctor. And the doctors finally gave up on her and said she would never speak or hear again in life. And she went and stayed the summer with my grandmother in Oakland and came back speaking and hearing after that summer. The Bible says things that are impossible with men are possible with God. Now, we saw things like this growing up, and, it was, and we knew it was a miracle, but we didn't know God whatsoever. We would tease one another about, um, man, you, you mess with me, I'm going to tell grandma you sick or something, <laughs> you know, and she's, and she's going to come and pray on you and, and, and all that stuff, teasing along those lines, but really not having a concept of what we were doing. And then um, one day I had already signed a contract with the Open A's out of high school, and I was playing in Modesto, California, and we had a Monday off, and I went to Oakland to visit my grandma. This is in 1978. And um, it just so happened she was having a Bible study at her house that day. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't want to be there. And, but I knew nobody else in Oakland. I had no place to turn. So I sat in on the Bible study that day. You weren't that honest with her, though, were you? <laughs> <laughs> Not at that time. Not at that time. But I sat in on the Bible study, and it was the first time that I really heard the Word of God. And it felt, it was, it was, it was nice, it was comfortable, it was loving. And so um, after the Bible study ended, she asked me, had I ever given my life to Christ? And I said, no, I had not. She asked me, would you like to? And it, I mean, I was 18, I was kind of cool, it ain't no big deal. So I said, all right. So we went through, said the sinner's prayer out of Romans 10 and 9. 
Um, I asked Jesus to come into my life and be Lord of my life. It wasn't a big deal the way I felt. So she said, thank God for saving you. So I said, thank you, Jesus. No big deal. My grandma said, no. She said, clap your hands and thank God for saving you. And so I was, I started out just, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And before I knew what was happening, man, my hands had lifted in the sky and I was mm. praising God. Thank you, Jesus, from my heart. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Well, the Bible says that um, <laughs> the devil comes immediately to steal the word that was sown in your heart. And as soon as I was praising God, um, the, the devil came and said, what are you doing? And I fell to the ground. And he starts throwing all these thoughts in your, in your mind. Man, you, you don't need that. You got potential. You have an opportunity to make it. You can, you've got some skills and all these other things. And I say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you <know? laughs> and so that, the, the truth, that was the day that I met, I, that I invited Jesus Christ into my life. But he wasn't Lord. I still did what I wanted to do, went where I wanted to go. And um, he did not have that place in my life. And so I rededicated myself to serve him in spirit and in truth. And the love of God is so awesome because it's not, it doesn't require anything from you. It's what Jesus has done. It has nothing to do with what we have done. It has something to do with what we have done because it has to do with your decision of who Christ is. Jesus came into the earth to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets unto the Father but by or through me. And the, tr the, the reality is either that's the truth or it's a lie. And how do he says he was God manifested in the flesh. And we as, as human beings were created in his, his image and given a free choice to do whatever. And so what, what is in your care is what do you do with Jesus Christ? You know, and Let me ask you this. Okay. It's because, because I hear that there's obviously two major events in your life. Oh, major, yes. With Jesus Christ. Um, at what point in there did you become perfect that you never made a mistake anymore? That, <laughs> you know, you never wavered and you took, made the right decision every day of your life? When did that happen? It hasn't happened. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it hasn't happened. That's the one thing that's so exciting about the gospel. I realize, I, every time I get in the Word and I study more and I read the Word and the years continue to pass and I, I, let's say I become more mature in God, then I realize I know nothing. Each year that passes, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything in Christ and I have to rely upon his grace so much. Um, but at the same time, he is such a loving God that it's available to who, whomsoever will. And that's why when I get a chance to travel with unlimited potential and we which is really so, it's such an awesome, it's an awesome ministry that travels around the world doing baseball clinics and preaching the gospel. And we get an, op we get an opportunity to offer the love of God in so many different countries. And it's so simple. And, it, and, it, and, and again, I, I know I'm reiterating, it has all to do with what Christ has done. You know, Jesus paid the price for our sins. He died on the cross and um, he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And that becomes so real that, um, uh, I mean, I'm here and we're doing this interview and we're doing things like that. And I'm not here so that you could know who the great Christian that Mike Davis is. That's nothing. You forget me, you've lost nothing. But if you forget who Christ is, if you forget Jesus Christ, then you've lost it all. And that's, that's what's awesome. real. As a baseball player, did you find it hard to share your faith or, or you feel like the odd man out uh, at, the, at baseball games or on the team as a professional athlete? No, not at all. I was, I was kind of bold, courageous. I was so sold out to, to share this, to share my faith that um, I was excited about Jesus, man. I was excited about the changes that he, I mean, I, see, I look at, I can't save anybody. I can't heal anybody. I can do nothing except be a vessel sometimes that God uses. And so when I would get out there and um, people saw that, they, they saw that God had did something. Because I'm not the same. I had I, I, the, the meeting that I had with God 
it wasn't just by faith, although faith is, a, is the way you receive it. But there was a personal meeting with God himself that was awesome to me. It changed me into a different person. And I, not like I was a bad person. I wasn't really a bad person. But it, 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 everybody that comes into the earth is born in sin, and that sin separates you from God. And um, the message that I, if I say anything, that righteous deed of Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the sins of the world, bridged that gap from God. Man was over here. God was over here. Jesus' righteous deed bridged the gap for man to get back to God. And, um, it says it. and I received that blessing. It says it. Amen. Amen. I appreciate you. No, I appreciate you, you my brother. You blessed us. I hope. I hope you enjoyed the golf. Oh, I know I you am. did. I, I praise God it. for the golf. <laughs> I, I have a new hero. See? Oh, you now you're I, being too kind. And, <laughs> and really enjoyed hearing you share from your heart. You got good company. I enjoy you guys. I love you guys. I this appreciate is, it. Thank Thanks. you so much, folks. If uh, if you were interested in, in what Mike shared, if it if it spoke to you, um, if if there's a little voice in there that said something to you, moved you a little bit. What I want to do is I want to encourage you to seek out the person who shared this program with you and ask them about it. Ask them what Mike's talking about. Ask them what the point of this is. Yes, I know if you follow the golf instruction, you're going to get better. But there's also a, a greater opportunity here for you. And that's what we want for you. So please seek out that person. And be blessed, and we're glad that you took time to join us. Thank you.